Alberto, you may start if you want. Okay, good. Thank you very much, uh, Mas uh, Idam. Selamat pagi, everybody. How are you today? Selamat pagi, Alberto. We're doing fine, thank you. So lovely to see you, Anna. Same here. Everyone else okay? Uh, have you got any questions before we can we we go on to today's session? Any questions? Bu Inas, selamat pagi. Everyone okay? Julius, are you fine? Yes, everything is okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Great. Thank you, doctor. Fine. Yes, and, uh, party, Salman. everybody. Okay. Now, um, I don't have any announcements uh, to make for today. Uh, so we, we, we can just go ahead straight to today's session. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Jenny, uh, Jennifer Murphy. I first met uh, Jenny in 2008. Uh, when I was invited to teach in Castellon uh, in the Peace Masters program for the very first time. And, um, you know, Jenny Murphy, I, you know, met her. She's a bubbly person, young at that time, still young right now. And over the years, we formed a, a very close uh, friendship. And, and uh, I recall that in our one of our meetings uh, when we were sitting and having coffee uh, on the campus of the you know Jomi Premo, and um, it, Jenny was saying to me, "I do not know what I'm going to do now." Uh, this was in 2014. I do not know what I'm going to do now. I want to go back to the U.S. and I'm just trying to think of something to do. And I said to Jenny, "Why don't you form an NGO?" And she looked at me and she said, you, you're, you're, you're kidding, are you? And she said to me then, you know, you must be joking. And when she saw that I would, for once in my life, I was actually quite serious, that she then uh, burst out saying, yes, you know, let's think about it. So the reason I'm talking about this uh, is because this is the, uh, I would say the genesis, the, you know, the, the, the giving of birth of the deep network because then Jenny Murphy and I, uh, one in San Francisco, me in Melbourne, we got together a group of people from Barcelona and then gradually deep started uh, that way. So it is, I would say very, really timely to have someone who is a founding member of the Deep Network now talk to you about an issue that is really important, which is a, you know, a project that is important in the deep network and this is how can we transform conflict from the possibility from its possible disruptive and destructive uh, nature to one that can be you know, uh, sort of life-changing one that can change um, the world for, for much you know uh, for, for a better world so without taking any more of uh, Jenny's time um, Thank you so much. I should also say to, to Jenny to, uh, you know, to contribute her time to this uh, course. And if I can also take, uh, indulge, you know, your attention for just one more minute. I should also point out to all the participants that in this course, we decided that it's going to be a free online course. All the presenters are doing this out of their own, you know, from their very difficult schedules, but they're doing all this pro bono for free and so does the university and the reason that we are making this gift uh, of sharing our knowledge uh, to all of you is because we believe we don't want to be repaid for what we might perceive as our generosity but what we would like you to do is then pass on this gift to others so that generosity will become the order of the day in our mm -hmm world of ours. So thank you once again for your generosity and your gift, uh, Jenny Murphy. Okay, well, 
Uh, Salamat pagi. I have a little bit of an echo. I hope you do not. Um, it might just be my connection, but I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so I would like to thank Alberto for having me. Uh, I was sharing with my family this morning what I'm, they're all together right now. I have a very big family. They're all together having a full day and a big dinner. And I had to leave early. I said, I got to go and prepare. I, I was prepared, but practice before. Uh, and they said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm doing this amazing course uh, at this university uh, in Indonesia. And then I started to explain who were the participants and they, their eyes. So I'm just so excited to be here with all of you. And this is, um, I don't feel as a pro bono. I feel as a gift to myself as well. So uh, I will start by screen sharing with you. At any time, please tell me if something goes awry technologically, because one of my flaws on Zoom is that I don't notice the chat. <laughs> so I will always check the chat, but probably too late, but I will come back, I promise. And I always, if there's a problem with the screen sharing, I don't always know. So please just let me know. Okay, so I'm going to share so I can give you a little bit of a direction of where, uh, and then I have to figure out how to do that. Okay, one second. So today's topic is called conflict transformation. And what we will do is a very uh, interactive approach to this topic. And we might begin in a spot that you think, how does this have to do with conflict transformation? But it really actually does have a coherency to it. So here is the plan for the morning session. I usually try to do too much. So let's see if I can, if um, this matches up. I will also upload this presentation onto the classroom, the Moodle classroom. So please don't worry about getting the uh, notes taken down. I will share everything. And also I have added slides that we don't have time to go over today, but that might be helpful for you later. So it's a kind of long uh, presentation, but we will not be able to do it all today. Okay, so if you can see, we'll begin with active listening, then we will go to politics of location, then we will do conflict activities. We'll break for the 15 minutes, just so everybody kind of does what they need, stretch their body, come back. Then I will do a little mini lecture, conflict transformation, but it will also be interactive. And then we'll do final reflections that sort of set us up for the case studies of the afternoon session. So we'll do a conceptual, uh, very hands-on sort of session this morning. And then you will get to apply that hopefully to case studies in the afternoon. So uh, let's see if we can accomplish what I would like to accomplish with you. So the first thing we're going to do is called active listening. So what I would ask of you is to accept, apply, and then adapt. So there, um, I will give you some guidelines for active listening, but then you are your own human. So you get to sort of accept those, figure out how you want to apply them and adapt. And then you also have to ask yourself, what travels and what doesn't? In this multicultural setting, not everything that comes from my very situated place travels possibly. So you get to ask yourself, what travels and what doesn't travel? But in the beginning, I would like us all to be very brave and to just do what is called active listening. So I'm going to put some ears on because we are all going to need to put some ears on. And we're going to try to invert the phrase, don't just stand there, do something, to don't just do something, stand there. Can we be still? Can we listen for total meaning, respond to our feelings, and note all the cues of another human being? Uh, I'm sure that many of you have done some type of active listening. In this way, we're going to do it. You can speak in any language. So it, it, whatever language is the most comfortable for you to speak in, 
is what you can speak in. And then there will be a partner, you'll get paired up, so just two of you, and you will have five minutes, it might feel long, but that's okay, five minutes to just speak what you need to speak. And then the, your partner with the elephant ears will be listening. And so what you will do is try as the listener to be fully present for the other human being. And you don't need to understand the language they are speaking to you because you're not practicing, hey, this is what you should do. Oh, you have that problem? Okay, I can help you with that. You're, not, you're trying to avoid becoming the protagonist of the scenario in the listening and just holding the space. So being a fully, deeply uh, listening being. Sometimes in a more Eastern philosophical sense, this means clearing all of the senses. So it's very difficult. Our brains, maybe you're hungry right now. I don't know. It's uh, seven, uh, 10 around here in the evening, but maybe it's morning and you didn't, you skipped your coffee and your, your uh, croissant or whatever you eat in the morning and you're starving. So it's difficult to have this full sense of ourselves in order to be present for another human being. And I was listening to the session you had with Gloria yesterday, and she also discussed deep listening through the circle process, peace process uh, by um, Capranis. So it's a similar feel for listening. Okay, so I'm going to, we're not gonna look at the theory or the conceptual framework. I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, and now I'm going to put you in um, breakout groups if I can make sure this works. So it will be just pairs. So even the people who are, I think I will be the only one not participating because I need to be aware of time. And that it, it's not okay to be a listener while being aware of time. But everyone else, I would ask for your participation and you can be um, bold and uh, brave in this moment. And you only share what, what you want to share because I mean, maybe you're complete strangers to one another. Uh, and, but as the listener, you're practicing holding the space. As the speaker, you are practicing being listened to. What is it like to be fully listened to? So this, uh, in terms of language, you can speak in any language, including silence, if you are the speaker and you get to speak about anything you would like. So possibly, let's say I was the speaker this evening with my partner. We would decide who's speaking and who's listening first. Then the one who is listening first would just figure out a way to feel that they're being present for the person on Zoom, which is hard. And then um, the other person will just begin to speak. Then I will bring us back to the room, do a little clearing, and then you'll switch roles again. Okay. So does that make sense to everybody? And if not, please just ask a question. Okay, so in terms of guidelines, if you are the speaker, you just speak until you're pulled back to the group. If you are the listener, you're just holding that space. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Uh... Um... Idam, I have one question, or Devi, I have one question. It says, breakout rooms in progress. Do I have to close those rooms in order to make new rooms? Um, yeah, you can recreate if... Okay, I'm going to close them. I hope that yes. doesn't happen to no, anything. Okay, great. Okay, here we go. Uh, recreate. 13, wait. Idam, one more question. How many people are we here right now? Um, we are, uh, the total is 42, but like the committee, I, I don't think they will join because they are standing by. Okay, so, so when, I, when I try to do it. Um, you can do the manually. So you can just pick a sign. Uh, a sign? Okay, but uh, sorry, it says that there. Okay, sorry. No, I want it to be. Okay, sorry. I got it. I got it. I got okay, it. I understand. All right. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Welcome. Two to three. Okay, so there will be 16 breakout groups, and some of you have a group of three. So um, uh, we will 
do, if you can, you can shift in your group. Um, for the group of three, I will give you a little warning of when to, when to shift uh, after the first session, okay? So we will actually will do four minutes. So if you, once you get into your breakout group with your partner, you will, um, you will decide who's talking and who's listening, okay? Okay, here we go. Let's see if we can do this. How come I cannot get, let's see. Okay, so this is so strange. Hold on, I'm going to try to recreate again. Three, three, three. Uh -uh. Sorry. 18, 19, let me see. Okay, I'm all, I almost have it. It's a problem with me understanding the math. No worries. There we go. We are perfect. So we are actually two, two participants per room because we are exactly an even number. And so here we will go. When you get to your room, you will um, decide who's talking and listening and whoever talks first, just talk whatever you need to get out today, um, whatever comes to you. Uh, for example, I could talk about, I was saying, I was very nervous, but excited to come today. And then the other person is just holding that space of listening. Okay, so here we go. And I will bring you back at five minutes. Okay, everybody, here we go. Okay. Okay, have they, have they, have you gone? Not joined. Uh oh. Okay, so. Sara, I'm going to move you. Okay, I think we're good. Okay. Shit. Idam. Okay, move to room 12. Okay, I'm assigning you, Irma, to room one. Oh, this is too hot in here. Okay. King, you would, uh, so after you finished talking, we would say, okay, take a deep breath. Everybody, if you can with me, let's take a deep breath. I really, I really need one because that was very stressful seeing you in a room by yourself with no one. 
And now what we'll do is I'll make a group of um, three. So that way I'm assured that you are in a room with somebody. And so if you're accidentally assigned to uh, an administrator or if you're assigned to somebody who doesn't click on, the, uh, the odds are that you actually will be there. So what we'll do is two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. And that means you've done one practice round, that's fine. Now you're gonna go into a different group. I will say, I will do this. I will ring our Tingsha bell and then you'll do two minutes. I'll send a message to your group that you uh, change the person. Then you figure out the order and you change. So it'll just be two, two, two. And for those of you who just did five minutes, well, you are stars. And for those of you who listened for five minutes, that is an excellent job. So let's see if this can work this time in a different sense. Um, luckily, this is the only time I need you in pairs because pairs is much more difficult than you would think. Okay, recreate automatically. I would like, no, I want uh, three people because what happened when I had, okay, two to three, hold one, hold the phone. Okay, there we go. Okay, so hopefully this works for most of you. Please come back if you don't have anybody to talk to. Don't just sit there by yourself. And um, what, we'll, what we'll do, yes? It was a very interesting session and uh, I and one person from Malaysia, Malaysia discussed a lot of things. And Great. it was very interesting. Yeah, it's a very uh, interesting. Okay. So you're telling me it was a good failure. Thank you. Okay, so this time though, what you're gonna try to do is not create a conversation. You're gonna try to only let one person talk and the other two people in the group listen. Uh, the way that these groups are worked out is that a couple of the groups have two people. So I'll make sure that you're, you're with people. And then I will send a message that says two minutes, change your partner. And then one more message, two minutes, change your partner. If you're only a group of two people, do not worry. Just continue to, to talk to each other for the last two minutes. Okay, let's see if this can work. And if not, thank you for making the most of it. Um, we'll get to the conceptual part in a bit. Okay, here we go. Opening all rooms, here we go. So uh, when, when we have conflict, sometimes I'll say, mom, can we do an active listening session? And that means I just listen for five minutes to my mom and then she listens five minutes to me. And then it usually creates the environment that deep listening creates. So hold on to your activity for a second because we're gonna return to it in a moment. And for those of you who had a strange experience, please don't worry, I'm gonna go over a couple of things on the slide. Uh, okay, can everybody see the slide? We're good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Perfect, okay, so uh, the idea of deep listening or beginning our session with deep listening is, you know, the first evening that I was with all of you, a very interesting question was asked, and it was asked, what happens if we have different political orientations or we want to say this is what the story is of this conflict? These are the players, this is what happened, and maybe someone over here is like, no, these are the players, this is what happened. And so we practice this activity of deep listening to build the respect that Alberto was talking about on our first session that is needed in order to talk about very difficult things in our realm. And if you are a, uh, in, in this context, we're thinking about, are you a conflict facilitator? Are you, is it somehow applicable in your work? Do you work for an NGO? Do you work with conflict? In some realm, you're gonna be a facilitator. And in that realm, to develop this deep skill of listening requires presence and empathy, and that we have to practice that. So you're going to have a session with Dr. Hedio de Bustamante, uh, Empathy, Love, Compassion, and Peace, that continues this. And I use these two quotes from Maya Angelou. If we lose love and self-respect for each other, this is how we finally die. And I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And one of the things that 
we allow people to feel deeply is when we can deeply listen. And I will weave back to this in the fourth section of this um, session. And so I am already very late, apologies. Uh, so, but let's think about in this deep listening moment that we have now created, what is the pedagogical sort of uh, map that, or the, the feeling that we want to bring? And I follow Paulo Freire, which Gloria mentioned to you all yesterday. Uh, and he said, reflection, if it is true reflection, leads to practice. And he wanted us to avoid mere activism and mere intellectualism. It requires both deep thinking for action, deep thinking for action. And so this is sort of what we will try to practice together today. And if one of you could be so kind, and I, I usually do this as my, in my classes of 30, not 60. So uh, if I ask, which I'm about to do, one of you to read the slide, possibly two of you will go at the same time and that's okay you can work it out between the two of you and we embrace the chaos that we can bring in that moment so if one of you would be so kind to read this quote for us please i'll do that human existence because it came into being through asking questions is at the root of change in the world there is a radical element to existence which is the radical act of asking questions. At root, human existence involves surprise, questioning and risk. And because of all this, it involves actions and change. Excellent. And so this is sort of the, the framework we're working under is how do we together in this Zoom space deeply think, ask questions and take risks. All of you took a risk in practicing active listening. I really appreciate you doing that because it's a very vulnerable experience to be listened to deeply. And it's a very vulnerable experience to listen deeply. And now we're in that space uh, that bell hooks for me really captured. Also Alberto talked to us about critical thinking on the first day. And this is sort of my jumping off point for that. And if one of you could also read this, it would be fantastic, please. Okay, I can do that. May I? Yes. Okay. The most exciting aspect of critical thinking in the classroom is that it calls for initiative of everyone, actively in inviting all students to think passionately and to share ideas in a passionate, open manner. When everyone in the classroom, teacher and students recognize that there are responsible for they are responsible for creating the learning community together learning is at its most meaning meaningful and useful in such a community of learning there is no failure everyone is participating and share whatever resource is needed at a given moment in time to ensure that we leave the classroom knowing that critical thinking empowers us great so we are not here. A lot of people think of peace studies as this naive approach to things because it doesn't deal with the real world. We are not naive. We are very situated, which we're going to go to next, in the real world. And we're also trying to imagine that which does not exist. And so this is, for me, why critical thinking is so essential to that. And so then how do I combine these two things? Uh, what happens when how I see the world and how you see the world are different. Now we're in the context of conflict and now we're in the context of conflict transformation. So we're just sort of setting the stage with active listening. And thank you for telling me it wasn't a failure. I, you're right in line with bell hooks. Um, but you can ask yourself right now, was it easier for you to, to do um, the listening or the talking? Both, neither. It depends. Uh, I would just like to take, um, I'm gonna make them bigger groups in case people don't join, but I would like to stop the share and then have you discuss with your partners. What was easier for you to do? Listen, talk, both, neither depends. Um, and then we're, we're gaining what I like to call sort of awareness building skill sets. So I'm gonna stop the share and send us off to breakout groups again. Now that I've got the system down, I think I can do it without it taking so long. I'm gonna make them um, bigger groups. 
so that I don't have any worries that somebody's not in a group with somebody. Okay, so they are four to five people in each group. Again, if you're in a group, if you're suddenly by yourself, please come back, leave, come back to the main room and I will reassign you. Okay, here we go. You're discussing what was easier for you or what was difficult and which one um, or both. Okay, here we go. Opening all rooms. Welcome back, everybody. Well, welcome back, everybody. So that's fantastic that you get to sort of explore for yourself. I'm going to, wait. first of all, I wanted to um, welcome Gloria again, your facilitator of yesterday. And she did such a fantastic job with your group that her computer exploded afterwards. So we are lucky that we, that you had that before the explosion. Okay, so let's get back to um, from active listening. Now you can see how I'm always off time. This is just Jenny Murphy in progress here, but I'll get us back on, I promise. So the next move from active listening, now we are being present for one another, but not in a sense that we just, everybody gets along, but that we are accepting that there's gonna be conflict and we are going to work within us to figure out, okay, what, what do we have to bring forward? And one of the um, sort of theoretical conceptual frameworks I would like us to think about for, for all of us to think about, uh, including myself, is what is this idea of a politics of location or a situated knowledge? And so for me, the, the beginnings of thinking about this began with Donna Haraway with situated knowledges, Chandra Talpade Mohanty with politics of location, and Adrian Rich with politics of location. And basically, these women, so third world feminists and also black feminists in the United States we're saying, you know, we are not all in the same spot. How do we talk about our differences in a brilliant way, but also the conflicts that they might create? And in a decolonial way, in a way that really uh, examines the inheritance of colonial ways of thinking, being, seeing, and doing, uh, that is very extractive, violent, uh, separating, destructive, uh, we can we we know the continuing colonial continuities of what's of our world today, from the Euro uh, colonial project to the Euro U.S. colonial project. So these thinkers ask us to say, what is it to for me to situate myself in relationship to the world in which I live? And that means we're not always going to have the full picture. So what are my blind spots? What are my, when do I hit my edge or my resistance? And how does that happen? So for me, uh, I would like to explore with you elements that I think are important for a politics of location, but not necessarily a definition. This is the how-to. And remember, you're finding for yourself what travels well and what doesn't. What is helpful for me in my toolbox of conflict transformation skills and sets and what possibly is not. Uh, so I got it too. So what I usually do with my students, and I will not do it right now, but later on, I will bring it to the chat the next time I stop the share. I always give them my own assumptions and my presuppositions. So they know how I have situated myself. And then this is an awareness. It doesn't mean they have to think like me or understand the world like me, but they are aware of that. And we are building our awareness together of the ways that we see, feel, understand the world. And moving, th this was more in the 1980s. And then moving to today, this movement of politics of location has become something of positionality. And it means that who I am cannot be splintered off. So I cannot take off my race. I cannot take off my age. I cannot take off my gender. I cannot take off my family status. I cannot take off my nation state and the privileges that come with maybe, I cannot take off my religion, although I might have a conflictive relationship with it. It becomes a part of who you are. And then how do we understand this in relationship to others? In my own context, you see at the bottom, it says identity, rugged individualism and the tension. Well, in a US context, 
the I, this ru idea of rugged individualism, the I, the super I, I do it, I pull myself by my bootstraps, becomes um, in tension with the situating the I, the softer I, who am I? Uh, if you come from a more collective society, then maybe it's to pull out the eye a little bit and the collectivism shoves it down. So this, what we're trying to do is create, create space for understanding who is it that is here in your, we are so unique individual beings. So who are we? And what does it mean to do this work to situate ourselves? And then that move from positionality to intersectionality. So the overlapping layers of oppression that influence the human being, so the person. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is a lawyer and also legal thinker and critical theorist who has really teased out this idea of intersectionality. And what it means is, when does it get erased? When do my the structural identities erase who I am. And what she did was she looked at this case and there, and this black woman was saying they're discriminating against me because I'm a black woman. And she lost the case because the, the argument was they hired black men and they hired white women. So who is erased in that intersection of race and, and, and gender? The black woman. And so what she was trying to do is say, where are their erasures? Where do we stop to think about the structural realities that influence the individual. So she wasn't so much looking at identity formation as the structural, trying to really say, how do we change the structure so that people have not these barriers before them? There's more equality. And so if I was in my US classroom, part of situating my knowledge, part of locating my politics would require me to do a land acknowledgement. So this is my really dear friend, Jonathan Cordero. He's one of very few remaining Ramai Tushaloni. I, I believe there's only about 22 people left in the, it's the indigenous group that um, were the stewards of, before colonization, the stewards of the land. And so this is the land acknowledgement that he gave to me that I can share with my students. And it basic, basically says we recognize that we benefit from the living and working on the traditional homelands of the first peoples. So how then do I understand this geographical, this identity, the structural realities of me as a human being? And then history. <laughs> so look at all of these pieces to a politics of location. Remember I said it's elements, not necessarily a definition. So now we have to think history. Uh, you know, James Baldwin is one of my favorite thinkers, writers. Uh, I, I just, today I'm reading his work again um, because he says history is the most terrible and the most beautiful. And we do not escape history in the present, that the history is always with us in the present. It's not in the past. So then what does it mean to also situate the historical moment? So if I'm talking about the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, I'm not talking about George Floyd only. I'm talking about all the way back to the enslavement of peoples and what that means for thinking and understanding today. And then what that means for me in that situated place. Uh, you can locate yourselves in your own environment and context, deep context to sort of have an understanding of that as well. And then Ruth King, also a one of my favorite thinkers at the moment, and she just came to a class of mine in person or over Zoom, one uh, amazing benefit of a tragic global pandemic is that many people felt very um, generous and she, she volunteered her time to come to class. And so what she adds is not just history, but ancestry. And so if one of you could read number one, and if one of you could read number two, that would be fantastic for how and why she talks about ancestry also as forming part of understanding our politics of location. I could read number one. Thank you. <clears throat> My belief if, is that if we inherit what our ancestor didn't or couldn't finish, as seekers, when we recognize we come from a long line of racial conditioning, not just our parents, but their parents and their parents, we touch into the weight of that 
unresolved, and it often can illuminate what we do, what we do. It textures and elevates our intentions. Fantastic. And somebody number two, please. Can I number two? Knowing, Go our for it. knowing our essential stories, not just history, help us recognize ourselves in them and in others. Fundamentally, knowing our ancestral stories helps tenderize our relationship and responsibility to humanity, something larger and older than ourselves. So now we have this wonderful sort of complementary history ancestrality to think about. And also because so much of a colonial mindset was to erase that. You have no language, you have no culture, you have no history. You have no, yeah, I mean, falsely so. So this look back to an ancestrality then also helps me as a conflict facilitator understand where do I stand in relationship to the encounters that I'm going to have. Uh, and so now we kind of see in this crazy slide here, what it is we're talking about with the politics of location. So what is a deep context, history, culture, social? I forgot to mention power. Within the, and maybe my biggest critique of our, of our um, reading for today is how do we examine and look at power because power can be so destructive, power over, and power can be so empowering, power to. In Spanish, it's poder, to be able to. So how do we deal with not only all of this on this slide, but also the power dynamics that are playing through it all. And you have the you, the we, the isms, how those intersect, the coloniality of power, uh, other ways of knowing, understanding, and being. And this, for me, is really important to do this type of inner examination, outer examination. I'm the individual, and what is the outside? And for us to ask ourselves, what is it easier for us to do? The inner look, look at myself, or the outer look, look at the, the world. I will admit to you when I was young, Alberto, I'm kind of getting up there. Uh, when I was younger, I was so much about the outer world. Go fix it. What is wrong with it? Resolve it. I had no idea of conflict transformation at that time. This is wrong. We have to change it. I still have a lot of that in me, my social fight. Uh, but I, I, I very rarely looked inward. And so what the politics of location asks us to do is this inner deep look and this outer look. And it asks us to say, which one do we tend to ignore? And the one we tend to ignore is the one we need to look at. Gloria uh, talked with you all about the directions and do you are you in your mind? Are you in your heart? Are you in your body? And what tends to come to you when that happens. It's very similar with this idea of uh, politics of location, this inner outer dynamic. So that brings us to awareness. We have deep listening, awareness of who we are in any context. In our, in our situation, we're talking specifically about conflict. Uh, so who are you within your community? Uh, the spirit, the mind, the body, the emotions, your body, the physical, but also the social and political. If I walk through a store, very rarely do the store people follow me. But if I ask my African-American students when they walk through the store, they are always followed. So no, how does the physical body enter the political and the social? And then what are all of the realities, the structural and also the uh, identity realities within that? And so the politics of location is asking us to build this awareness in my view, and also with relationship to power. So I threw up, uh, I didn't really introduce myself. You might say, wow, this one just went right for it with active listening. Uh, I didn't introduce myself because what I wanted to do was see if I could, I still have eight, we're good, right? Okay, uh, I have a half hour, I think. Um, what I would like to do for you is put this politics of location in a storytelling form. And also for you to think about as I'm telling my story, what would you include in your story? How would you tell your politics of location? Um, 
what are the social forces that are involved, my family. So, but I'm going to go pretty personal. And I chose <laughs> this cowgirl picture of myself because it's a pretty stereotypical picture of someone in the U.S. from uh, Halloween. So another very stereotypical thing of who is Jenny Murphy and how would I, what is this process of coming to um, through my lived experience, through my deep reading and thinking through my encounters, what, what has happened? So I hope I'm gonna put a little timer on for myself and see if I can do this. So I would have to begin with my family. And if I could, I'd have every member of my family on the screen because for me, the family importance is essential. Uh, I am one of four, so there's a boy, my brother, and then three girls. The three young women are all unmarried to the chagrin of everybody and also to the chagrin of my students who tell me to get on dating devices immediately. Um, so it's a strange reality that there's my brother who's married and has one child and then three uh, sisters who are not married. And so this would be the Murphy family. But then you might ask yourself or I might ask myself, okay, what is this Murphy family? Uh, and then I have this map and I'm gonna sort of go through this map with you. If I was looking in Ruth King's asking of me, of my ancestry and my heritage, I would say the Irish, the Murphy, the Murphy that's on my name here is the Irish, the Dank of my father's mother is German. And then the Karam of my mom's mom is Lebanese. And so we have this, heritage of Jenny Murphy, and then moving to the United States, or what I understand to be United States. And then you could say, okay, and then she's from the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. And you might say, oh, yeah, I know that. That's the Golden Gate Bridge, oh, the Icon Bridge. And they have those crazy houses that are called Victorian houses, and all the big buildings are on the water. And they eat hamburgers and pizza, <laughs> but also all of this other amazing food because it's a sort of fusion of all the immigrant waves coming together to create food. So, but really, who am I? Who is Jenny Murphy? And I could show you pictures of my infancy and childhood. And I chose pictures that are very stereotypical US so that you could say, oh yeah, I, I've seen that in a movie. Um, so I played a lot of sports. I, they forced me to be a cheerleader. I did not want to be, um, you know, my family at Halloween, just being together. And then you could ask, okay, well, what is her adolescence like? And this is my high school years. And this is Carlos Herrero in the middle. And I had, he was, a little shorter than I was. So I, I kind of went like this so we could be equal height. And I, my sister, my little sister, she did this huge, um, she knew I would not want to be prom queen. So she got all of her friends together and then organized the school to vote me and to embarrass me, basically. So you have all these ideas of um, protests beginning in my high school years when the US starts invading Iraq and illegal wars or the US, the first Iraq war. Um, in my young adulthood, you might start to say, okay, what happens? I, I go to school, I become very politically active. My, I moved to Japan for a year and a half right after um, graduation. And then you could ask adulthood. So what is so interesting about my story and any story is it's non-linear. You might be saying to yourself right now, Man, this is kind of bouncing all over the place because how do you capture one human being in all of this? Very difficult. And it's non-linear just as conflict transformation is non-linear. And it's back and forth and we're complicated onions, layers, we peel back. Um, and I was actually supposed to, after uh, I did a lot of field work and I was very disappointed with development work. And that's why I studied the masters in Castellón de la Plana in, in same as Gloria and Idam and Ari. Um, and then I was supposed to go to Lebanon to work with uh, Palestinian refugees. But I fell in love with Limam El Khalil Ali. 
And we, the only way we could be together was if we both got a student visa that would allow us to stay in Spain. And that is how I got my doctorate, which is how I meet Alberto, which is how I'm here. No, but really, honestly, it's a crazy kind of story. You can see Ari in the left-hand corner, right in the middle there. And you can see Idam in the lower corner because I was very blessed to have both of them in my classes. And so what brings, you know, this crazy story of a human being together. Teachers, so I send you my favorite teacher of all time and probably the human being that most uh, impacted the way that I thought about, saw, understood the world. And he was the South African poet laureate. I didn't know he was um, exiled and living in the US when I had him as a teacher and I had no idea, I was young, naive, if you grow up in a U.S. setting, as you mostly know, um, your history is pretty poor. And so you have to <laughs> do a lot of making up. Uh, and he was the first one to start asking questions that made me think about the place of the United States in the world, but also this colonial sort of perspective. And also got me involved in political action on campus. So. Uh, what you're seeing in the US now happened in California in the 90s. So all the anti-immigration, all the anti-affirmative action measures happened in California in uh, the 90s when the demographics of the state were, sh were shifting as well. And so I got very involved in these movements. And then he asked me to start thinking about why was your world segregated? Why did you grow up? Why, if uh, we are pretty diverse, Bay Area, why was your world so segregated? Why did students from East Palo Alto, a predominantly African-American community, get bused to your school? Why uh, did most of the houses around you were white people there? And then I did the research and that's because there were these covenants, that means it's written into the will of a home that you could not sell your house to a person of color, Asian person, black person, brown person, it was not, they wouldn't allow it. So now we're talking about the structural reality that Jenny Murphy is living in of segregation and racism, not just in the South, which people in California like to say, oh, the South, they're so racist. Why is it like that? But in our own, in our own geography, what, what created this segregation? Um, and then, you know, really looking at the history of the first 12 chief executives of the United States owned enslaved people, and we weren't taught that history. What does that mean? What significance does that have? Why do countries erase uh, the truth? And this gets very difficult in a time of post-truth. So then I would have to talk about my grandmother, my Jadetti. Um, so my grandmother, uh, their family moved to the United States on the Mexican side of the border. Gloria, Paisa. Um, and the, they only moved to the United States because there was a conflict and a skirmish and the border was open. And so they moved one town over, literally one town over. Now there's a huge, huge wall there. But at that time there was not. So they just moved over to the Arizona side. And my grandmother spoke French, the French uh, with her siblings because they, it was a French colony, Arabic with her parents, Spanish in the street, and she learned English in school. And she would tell me these stories of being beaten, beaten for mixing up languages. She'd say gris, gray in Spanish instead of English, and she would be beaten for it. And so then there's this assimilationist mode that happened. Don't teach your children the language, cut them off going back to the colonial, cut them off from any type of ancestry. Uh, and so it was a long time for me to try to figure out where do I place myself, if you go back to my map, German, Irish, Lebanese, in this Euro colonial project um, with this woman, my grandmother was one of my most, um, I don't know how to explain if you have that person in your life that is your grounding, loving, beautiful spirit was my grandmother. Uh, and also to think that in the time that they were married, my grandparents, 1939, it was actually illegal. So in the US, there were these laws, anti-miscegenation laws that did not allow people to intermarry across race. So now this is my complicated history, ancestry, story, and who am I in that? 
I, I mean, I'm so divorced from so much of the breadth of that as Jenny Murphy. And who am I when I'm taught the United States and yet there's this other tribal nations map right before us that we can see. Which one of these is true? Or I'm taught the San Francisco Bay Area map and here is the Salson peoples and how they understood and named the world in deep connection to the geography of that world. Usually the names are by water, mountain, tree, deep description of the world, not San Francisco, the Spanish conquest. So now I get very interested in these ideas of borders. Since I was about, this is very strange, but since I was about 12 years old, I collect pictures of walls because I don't understand how people can build walls. And so part of our conflict transformation that we're discussing today, okay, 10 minutes, five minutes. Um, part of what we're discussing today is how do we transform this world that builds these types of walls? Um, and in that, I could go very deeply personal. So I was out in the structural realm of racism, uh, conquest, colonial reality, and now I'm moving into the deeper realms of my inner personal life, which was that my father was uh, an active alcoholic for the first six years of my life. And he stopped drinking when my mother uh, basically said, I'm going to have to leave you unless you drink, stop drinking. And then he did. But the first six years of my life uh, are, I don't know if you've read anything about addiction or um, alcoholism and what that means in your early developmental years, but you have to work a lot on perfectionism, uh, pleasing others. And so my ancestry, my father had a very difficult home life and the people around me, what, what then is that? And what does healing, how does healing come into that? So we're gonna look later in the second half how Lerak begins with this idea of conflict transformation and also leads to healing within deep violent conflict. That can be from violence on the most interpersonal levels to violence at the state levels that we we're talking about. And so for me as a human that much, if Gloria had asked me yesterday, am I a mind, heart or body? I'm somewhere between heart and body, but definitely not mind. And so I was a literature creative writing a uh, writer. And for me, the way to get to the depth of pain is through poetry. So I was wondering if one of you could read in your most poetic voice, Harlem by Langston Hughes uh, for all of us. I can read. Thank you. Um, I'm Lebanese too, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, like, yeah. And I have to tell everyone that your mother's surname, Karam, means generosity. So you should, oh. you should say that and, and, oh. and, and chose. You're very generous in the information you're giving. I'm so excited about that. Yeah, you see, Lebanese are great, no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I chose to read this because you just said with the most poetic. Uh, um, when uh, in, in my adolescenthood, um, I used to write poems and in many languages because I speak many languages. So that's why um, I decided uh, because at school they, they were always asking me to, to read something about in, like in big events, no? So I'm gonna start. <laughs> what happens to a dream a deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? or fester like a sore, and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over, like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? Wonderful. So for me, this poem really captures the the humanness, we, we can only stand so much before we explode. Maybe it's even destructive to ourselves. So this is the challenges when we talk about conflict transformation, I really wanna drive this home. It is complicated, it is not, oh, all you have to do is think in a positive way and things can transform. No, we are talking about the deep 
structural reality. Sorry, I have one minute before I hit my 15 minute mark. So could somebody read Audre Lorde who also speaks from a more conceptual level? We just heard the poetry and now let's hear why does poetry become so important? Thank you for that. I read? Yes. Okay. Um, poetry is not a luxury. It is a vital necessity of our existence. It forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change, first made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action. So this, great, thank you. This poetry then, this, this, this need for meaningful life comes deep from within us. And as conflict facilitators, this is, the this is the landscape we are navigating, poetic human beings with complex realities. So uh, in my time before becoming, before love pushed me into academia, and I'm still kind of upset about it because the relationship didn't work out, although he's still a deep friend of mine. Uh, but because I'm much more practical, I, I, I really resonate with Lederach, our reader of today, because I'm much more practical than academic, but I'm, le I'm in the academic world. So I studied the Western Saharan protracted conflict from the perspective of uh, US, the US role in that. Uh, and this was my research and the time I spent about six months in the refugee camps, and this is my family. I, I consider them my family. But I also have worked in Ecuador, El Salvador, Colombia. I know there's some Cali people out there, Javeriana. I've taught at La Javeriana. Um, yes. And so, <laughs> so uh, Cali. So um, the, the, I, I, I had my field experience was in these places first, and then, and then with my, I went to academia. But if I ask myself, what is uh, conflict transformation in these different contexts is so different. What, my time in a protracted, uh, today you're talking about self-determination in the afternoon, so non-self-governing territory, to the dollarization in Ecuador and the, um, the, the disruption in so many people's lives there, to uh, the, you know, misplaced, displaced peoples in Colombia with whom I got to so humbly work. Um, so we're, we, and then now today, I would say my landscape or my field work is my students in the United States who many of my students, for example, have people, have family members in the military. So I have to be very careful. How do I explain to them? What is the US's role in the world? in an honest way without them feeling defensive about the fact that their family member is uh, abroad, you know, fighting for freedom. Uh, and the, the, the challenges of telling the truth in a place where truth <laughs> can be, what did she call it? Um, you know, that secondary truth or an alternative fact. Uh, and so this is my journey now is how do I transform in my classroom, I can have a white supremacist who doesn't really know there are white supremacists and the uh, liberation leader fighter that wants change. And so how do we do that together in a respectful way while also telling the truth and sometimes the truth is hard. Um, so it's not about shying away from the conflict. And for me, if I think ancestry and I take the indigenous knowledges that my friend um, uh, uh, that I get to work with today. I get to work with many people working to save indigenous languages. Uh, what does that mean for our future generations? Because it was never, the US mantra and colonial mantra is always forward thinking, always unlimited growth, always no, no past and no thinking about future generations. So what happens if I think seven years, seven um, generations forward and seven generations back as if it is interconnected, as if time is not linear in this colonial sense. And this really starts to get us at the heart. Ooh, I, I, did, I failed. I failed the 15 minute challenge. Um, the, and then this gets to my new work that I'm also doing, which is working with children and trying to begin the journey earlier for social emotional abolitionist work. So it's really taking uh, how do you work with music, social emotionally in, a, in addressing the race reality in the United States? So um, that, that's sort of me, my challenge, I did failed, I failed again, 
Um, but I would love, we have about nine minutes before break. So uh, I'm gonna have to shift the time for the second half, but I would love for you to think about in a breakout group, I'll try to do groups of three, maybe four, because I'm, I get nervous about somebody not having somebody, where you can share what would be important if you're thinking about this politics of location. Or maybe you just share one thing about what is a, 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 um, a blind spot you've noticed that you might have. Um, or when do we hit our edge for something? So for example, you know, I can be so empathic, but not when somebody is racist. I just have the hardest time to do that. So I have to do a lot of work, a lot of conflict peace work to say, how do I meet this human being before me, even though they hold such violent views in, in my view. So I would love for you to try to start breaking down what is your politics of location before we move, we'll break, and then we'll do the second half, which is more conflict oriented. So I'm gonna stop the share. While I'm remembering, I'm gonna pull um, two, excuse me for a second. I'm gonna pull two documents into our thing here, dialogue and listening. Oh, I hope I can share this. Uh, let me do it to everybody. Please work. Okay, great. So you should get dialogue and listening. And then I'm also gonna pull in the notes on the, uh, I put together notes for the little book of conflict transformation. For those of you who would be like me and maybe didn't quite do the reading yet, um, maybe in the break, you wanna take a look at that. But for now, what we'll do is a breakout group where you really examine, now we've done deep listening. Now we're locating ourselves in a very aware way, the inner outer, and what would you share? And we don't have a lot of time. We have about now, cause I keep talking seven minutes. So we'll do it for seven minutes and share what comes to you. And if you don't know what to talk about then whatever comes up is exactly right for the moment. Okay, so I'm gonna do this now, recreate. So I'm gonna get new people. Uh, let's do, okay, here we go. I hope this works and wait, maybe it's too many. Okay, four per participants per room and hopefully you have enough. Here we go, uh, seven minutes. You can stop record people who are recording, please. Thank you so much. Let you know when, oh, okay. Recording in progress. Okay, 35 seconds. It's also so strange because my students are not muted, so it's very loud. So this is a very different, <laughs> uh, very quiet Zoom. That's okay. <laughs> okay, 12 seconds. We give everybody the time to come back. Okay, welcome back to everyone. I absolutely know that was not enough time. I imagine you were like, don't, we didn't even, I didn't even talk. <laughs> Uh, so I apologize for the time. Maybe what we can do is return to that at the end, just because I'm so off time. Alberto is so great. He said, Jenny, we're in Indonesia. We're going to go. What did you say? Apakawa. We just live by <laughs> little. We're gonna get this done and go with the flow and groove it. So, um, what I would love for, if we can maybe take our 15 minute break now, does that work for everybody? Yeah. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do is put my video on stop video, not stop video, um, hide, so I can do a little adjustments to the uh, time in the presentation. And then the, it'll make sense what we're gonna do in the second half when we come back. Uh, so what time should we come back, Ari? 50, 10, 15. 10, 15. Okay. 10.50? Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody. 10.50.
we all on board with that? Okay, so I will see you in about 15 minutes. And for the people in my group, I will be back in a little bit. I'm gonna just uh, do a couple things here. So I'm muting and I'm hiding.
Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody. I just wanted to let you know I'm sharing. It's taking a long time because I have a lot of slides. Many of you, as I said, I'm not very good at water, watching the chat, monitoring the chat. So there were people who at, requested the presentation also to be shared here. So I've just done that. It's just taking time to upload on because it's so many slides. So I just wanted to let you know that that is happening. So I'm going to wait. Thank you, Professor. It yes, I'm me gonna... and thank you for sharing oh, it. Sure. And uh, there are a lot of extra slides. So if you ever have a question, I'm going to type my email here. You can just ask me because some of the slides we didn't have time to, we won't have time to go over. So feel Thanks free. a lot. Yeah, email me. Okay, and then, um, great. Okay, so it's up there. That's just the presentation from today. Um, I hope, I didn't take a look, so I hope it, it did it okay, but I will also put it on the online Moodle classroom. So what I'm gonna do is just share again and I hope you don't feel like this bear here, that you still have some energy to continue. And we're gonna move from deep, deep listening to contextualization, deep contextualization of who we are as conflict facilitators and now to conflict activities. So kind of, if you like to look at the structural out there only maybe pushing you a little bit here, but also remembering the structural. So we're gonna do an activity that you would need some kind of book to write in. Preferably if you could handwrite it, but um, no problem if you wanna type it. Uh, but there's something about the paper and the hand and that motion that is, is just powerful. So if you can, we're gonna take, um, I think five minutes is a little too little. So I, I, I let's just see how five minutes feels and then I'll try to feel into the energy of the room and see if we need a little time. But if you could do, uh, think of a conflict in your situated located context. So that means it can be anything in, I mean, I the US is everywhere in conflict. So I could choose anywhere uh, we're causing problems. Or I can choose something at home, which is more what I would think I would write about is the racial dynamics right now in the US and the voter suppression that's going on right now, which is systematically, um, you know, so uh, trying to get us back to Jim Crow times. So um, that's probably what I would write about. But then what do you, try to ask yourself this question, when did it begin? Where does this question lead you? And what is interesting, if you talk to John Paul Lilidak, the reading from today, is he says, when you ask this question, sometimes people will say, oh, you mean the fighting from last week? And then you'll come back for another cup of tea. And then you say, oh, you mean, you know, two years ago when this happened? And then you go back for a third cup of tea. Oh, you mean pull out the key of your grandmother's house who told you the story of losing it. Yeah, so when, what this time frame, Lederach asks us to really consider space and time, uh, nonlinear time and expansive space. So if you could write for just five minutes and let, I'll, I'll check it five minutes and see what it looks like of a conflict that you would like, that is something you feel you need to write about right now. Ask yourself, when did it begin? And where does this question lead you? Okay, so what I will do, I will also be doing this. Uh, every time I do it, something new arises and I grow as a facilitator. So I will ring the bell and then when it's time to finish up a thought, I will ring it again and then we can all finish up uh, and then I will let us let us all know what's the next step. Questions or anybody not understand? I always forget to ask that, so please don't feel shy to just tell me, Jenny, I don't understand. Okay, here we go. We're just writing for five minutes. Idam, can we have maybe a little music? Is it okay? 
Maybe Dom is not there. Okay, well, just write for five minutes, please. Yeah. I'll tell Idam. Okay.
Thank you, Idam. Okay, so just finish up whatever thought you are on now. And I'm going to um, stop the share. Oops, that was strange. Okay, and actually I need to share one more time, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I have a strange thing out there we go. Okay, sorry about that. I have to share one last screen. So when you go into your breakout room now, great breakout group now, you can think your conflict story, which is really our conflict story, if you believe we are radically interconnected as I do. You don't have to believe that, but it, that is my orientation. And so if I'm coming from this deep listening to this politics of location that is intersectional, positional, ancestral, historical, deep dialogue, empathic engagement, and peace, shout out, then we are also thinking in this elicitive conflict transformation way. And that means the people in the room matter. So who is in the room matter? I don't come in as an expert and tell you how to figure something out. In the elicitive conflict transformation approach, you recognize that what is in the room is already there to, it already exists. The way to transform is there. You trust that it is in that room and you cannot bring expertise besides the facilitating skills that you might have, deep listening, deep empathy, being there to understand and hear the stories. So what I would love for you to do then is to think, who is in our Zoom room? Who are we? How do we understand conflict? In this specific sense, a very specific conflict that then you get to do in the afternoon as well, empirical uh, hands-on case studies. This is the much more conceptual realm. So now you're thinking, all right, here's my politics of location. Here's my conflict. What am I going to share? And now we're thinking, how am I going to deep listen to that? Because maybe we don't agree with what the person says, or maybe we don't have never experienced what that person has experienced. So uh, what I would love for us to just do is share within the breakout groups what you feel comfortable with what you wrote in your, in your active writing notebook. And please don't ever feel that you have to share if you um, don't want to, only that which feels uh, necessary for you to share. Okay, so I'm gonna stop that and get back to the breakout room and recreate these guys. Let me just see here. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do this. Sorry, I wanna make it less. Okay, here we go. Let's hope this works. Please come back if there's no one in your room. Remember, I'm doing my best, but sometimes it doesn't work. Here we go. Okay, you can stop record possibly because this is going to be 10 minutes. Okay, we are just waiting for the last people to possibly come back in seven seconds. Okay. Okay, so we are all back. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, and think about now with your sort of politics of location, the history, awareness, ancestrality, uh, this, this phrase, which I really love, we don't see the world as it is, we see it as we are. And this is Anais Nin, a French Cuban American diarist, essayist, novelist, and writer of short stories. And so for me, what this asks me to do is to see more we's. So the more we, the more everybody out there I can see, the more I can connect to something that might be very different from me. Uh, so what do you see? Just want to do a little fun thing here. 
Gloria did it with the faces, which was so funny when I watched that. Uh, but what do you see here? A duck or a rabbit? If you cannot see either, <laughs> then we're in trouble. No, I'm teasing. Okay, what do you see? Uh, now we can see both. You can see both. Great. Okay, what do you see? A young see lady? Both. Oh, you see both. See Wonderful. Both. Good. Yeah. Um, uh, what do you Only see? Young... You said so. <laughs> okay, what do you see? A young lady or an old lady? Two women. Old lady. Old lady. Yeah. Both. The old lady has both, the small chin, and the young lady is like turned old like lady. this. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just hold on to that. Uh, and what do you see? Three or four? Four. Three. Four. <laughs> three. <laughs> three. Four. Three. Four. Three. Four. Three. Four. Three. <laughs> More than three. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Fantastic. Okay, so that's just a fun way to think about how do we know? How do we make meaning? What do we see? I mean, this idea of seeing is um, a very uh, um, metaphorical way of conceptualizing. What do we see? And so um, if we think about my more indigenous knowledge influence, um, by Gregory Cajete, he asks us to think in an experiential way. What have we experienced? And then through what we have experienced, how do we understand our aspects of being or existing? In the US context, uh, many black thinkers don't just talk about being, they talk about existing because the right of existence is not guaranteed in the US. Uh, you know, to be shot by police, to be shot in one's home. And so this idea of how do we understand existence or being? And, and he asks us to think of it in, in a holistic way, not just the mind of academia or what you explored with Gloria yesterday, but mind, body, emotion, and spirit, the whole being. And so you can ask yourself in school, were we uh, educated in this holistic way? Did we ask to think about how our body felt, how our emotions were, what our mind was, what our spirit was. Did we have this intellectual knowing of the mind, somatic knowing of the body, affective or feeling knowing of the heart, intuitive gut knowing of the spirit? Was that valued in the system that we were educated in? And I, that answer is gonna be very different for each of you depending on your circumstances and where you were. And so then this idea of looking at conflict, thinking about conflict in relationship to ourselves in a deep listening way, we begin to build awareness. And this for me is all framing what Lederach talks to us about in conflict transformation. So uh, that's what we're gonna move on to next. And um, anything that you want to say right now, if you can just wait a little bit, we'll have a open discussion at the very end. And so you can ask yourself how, first of all, what is your comfort level with conflict? How do you feel about it? I, I don't like it at all. I am actually known as the peacemaker in my family. I don't like when conflict happens. I had to do a lot of work to see conflict as this creative force for positive social change or any kind of transformative change. But literally what Lederach is asking us to do is to think about conflict resolution as the term. And is there a way to think, be, feel differently about this? So he talked about conflict has reached the worst expression and therefore has to re be removed or dealt with, to get rid of, to resolve it. And then he asks us to shift to this idea of transformation. So conflict as a part of life comes from a starting point that conflict is part of our lives. What in it what in it needs to change because it is taking life away instead of nurturing life, because conflict can nurture life. It is how change happens, the ebb and flow, the seascapes that come and go. What change are we interested in and how can we transform it? So if you think about the conflict that you wrote about, do you have this more, or this is not a um, evaluative or a judgment, just what is your orientation to be resolved, get rid of, finish? or to transform it, to use the uh, inner capacities that we have 
to be creative and to transform it. And he's not talking about the most violent conditions. He's talking about, um, you know, conflict that is, that has this potential for transformation. And, and what he does say is in the most violent, then we're in the realm of inexpressible, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But he asks us, Lederach asks us to imagine something rooted in the challenges of the real world, yet capable of giving birth to that which does not yet exist. And for me, this is really challenging when I've been taught to think of time as linear and to want change immediately. So he's asking us to reframe our concept again of space as expansive. Time is not so linear. It takes time uh, to change and to keep ourselves rooted in the real problems of the world. And then how do we give birth to that which does not yet exist? So this is his work, The Moral Imagination. And Lederach always talks about, he writes one work and then moves to the next. So he wrote The Moral Imagination and then moved to conflict transformation because he was realizing in his work that resolution was being used in this way that made the communities with whom he was working say, hey, you don't know what we, we know our conflict. And when you come in with this resolution language, you tell us as if you, you make us feel as if we don't know our own situation. And there's no quick fix to this. There's no way to do that. Uh, so the reading that you had today, we're, I'm gonna pull out the parts that I think are the most interesting. This might be helpful for you to think about your uh, little, you know, as Alberto asked us to do each day, write something. Um, but uh, I also put the document with the summary on our chat. I can put them all on the chat again at the very end to make sure everybody has it, but I will also up upload it all to the classroom. So one of the things that Lederach tells us is that, sorry, I have to move this for a second. When he's talking about conflict, is that it is normal in human relationships and conflict is a motor of change. And so just this reorientation, just this slight difference uh, helps the mind shift to be able to look at conflict possibly differently. Yeah. And then, and then hmm? conflict transformation <laughs> is directly connected to seeking constructive change. So how do we see conflict as normal, a motor for change, and then what do we want to change? And he gives this definition. Conflict transformation is to envision and respond to the ebb and flow of social conflict as life-giving opportunities for creating constructive change processes that reduce violence, increase justice in direct interaction and in social structures, and respond to real life problems in human relationships. So if we go back to our politics of location, all of this is here. The history, the ancestry, the lived realities, the rooted in the real, not in some, oh, A plus B equals C solution. Um, and this is what he calls a transformational approach. So it's a whole shift in approach. Uh, a transformational approach recognizes that conflict is a normal and continuous dynamic with human relationships, but the key to transformation is a proactive bias towards seeing conflict as a potential catalyst for growth. So you can ask yourself, do I do that? I can honestly tell you no. I have to work very hard to do this type of work. Uh, I'm a very positive human being, but I, 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 you know, conflict is very uncomfortable for me. So I don't always see it as this uh, constructive possibility. And I also have a strong social justice sort of push in me that makes it, I want it to change now. And he says, a transformational approach seeks to understand the particular episode of conflict, not in isolation, but as embedded in the greater pattern, constantly moving, fluid and dynamic. And so We've got this embeddedness and yet this fluidity at the same time. And so how in any conflict situation are we able to look at all of this together? Um, and then he says, conflict in relationship. So conflict flows from life. As I have emphasized above, rather than seeing conflict as a threat, we can understand it as providing opportunities to grow and to increase understanding of ourselves, of others, of our social structures. Conflicts in relationships at all levels are the way life helps us to stop, assess, and take notice. So conflict also creates life. Through conflict, we respond, 
innovate and change. Conflict can be understood as the motor of change, that which keeps relationships and social structures honest, alive, and dynamically responsive to human needs, aspirations, and growth. And so this doesn't always mean it's in a functioning way. I mean, it, it, he, he's not being naive here. In fact, he says, if it cannot respond to the, uh, the issues of the moment, then there's a problem, a big problem. So it has to have this ability to respond. Um, Okay, sorry, I've got things in my way at the moment. Sorry. Ah, okay. Wow. Okay, there we go. So conflict as violent. So he recognizes that social conflict often develops violent and destructive patterns. So it must focus on process. So in, in the violent destructive patterns, then what are the parts of the process that need to be looked at? And then it has to, as I said, be able to respond to the real life challenges. And then he goes, and this part, you really, I really recommend you read uh, thoroughly because he talks about the personal, the relational, the structural, and the cultural. And he says that the goals of conflict relation, sorry, transformation must reach the personal, relational, structural, and cultural. So again, if we go back to the politics of location and those the inner, outer realms of the human being in relationship to our communities and society, what might that mean? And then I got to move this around. Um, what does it involve? It involves the full person, including the cognitive, emotional, perceptual, and spiritual dimensions. So if we think back to Cajete and an indigenous knowledge approach of the whole human being is not, for me, what is so wonderful, if I recognize what a colonial mode does, separate, um, segregate, pull apart, then what is a mode that doesn't, that brings us together, that sees the whole body. And for me, this is this whole person understanding. We are much more than just our minds. And how do we understand the world and provide meaning in that world? So then he asks us, how do we end something not desired and build something we do desire? So sort of seemingly simplistic, but also quite difficult if it's very hard to answer, when did the conflict begin? Um, so what I would love to do now is move a little bit from the work that we were given to what his next work. So we went from um, the moral imagination to conflict transformation to this other work called Blood and Bones Cry Out. And that is a shift to how does conflict transformation help us think about healing? And then the, the, what is it that gets damaged in these violent processes? So I just put these two books that I highly recommend that relate this transformative approach to um, healing, if any of you are interested in that. And luckily, again, remember we had Ruth King come to uh, a Zoom room. Well, Lederach, one of our students, also from Lebanon, Yara, was loved Lederach and said, you know, she was doing her own conflict work. And I said, well, I will try to write him and see if he'll come to the Zoom room. And he did, he responded and he came. I don't have um, permission to give the full, I, I didn't get a response from him to know if I could share the full 45 minutes that he gave the talk with us, but it's so fascinating. I will definitely share it if he allows me to, but I did take a little portion because I think it's okay to share a little portion with you. And so I um, wanted to do that. And the way that I would like to do it is play it on my computer, but that might not work for you. So I will also send you the link. I made a YouTube of it so you can or you can do the link and just mute us and watch it on your own device so that we have the two things happening at once that um, I believe you can mute me. Can you mute me? I don't know if you can mute me, but I'd like to have it playing. And then I hope you can mute me if it's getting in the way of you watching the um, video. So before we do that, I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to put in the chat um, I have to get it really quick. Sorry, everybody. The YouTube link. Or maybe it's better. Well, I don't know. Maybe for the recording, it's good that I do it. So I'm going to do it for the recording. Um, but for everybody who 
I will also put this link on the online classroom. So please use that link if what I share right now is choppy or you cannot hear it. Is that okay for everybody? That makes sense? Yes, Miss. Okay, great, perfect. If there's a yes, problem, okay. please. Dennis, okay. so yeah. shall, we, shall we open it here to share screen? Ah, you, you do it. Okay. Yeah, I'll share, oops, sorry. Wrong one, I don't you know what to, that is. You want us to share, I share the I shared a, I shared our screen. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so I'm gonna put it here so okay. that it'll record, I hope. And if it doesn't work here, then remember you have the um, link. Okay, here we go. This is John Paul Lederach and he's moving with conflict transformation and healing and sound. If it's not linear, what is it? And what's non-linear? And so we set about that task by trying to listen more carefully to the everyday language that people tended to use. And what we found was not exclusively, but a lot of the metaphor comes back to sound. And so, um, and this, if I summarize the whole book in 15 seconds, here it is. So you don't even have to read it. You can just remember this set of sentences. The, the very first thing we heard consistently from many people who had experienced violence was some form of the phrase, I felt numbed. In fact, I felt so numb that I could feel no, nothing, nothing alive in me. It was like my body stopped uh, vibrating. It was, I was numb. I could hear words, but I couldn't make sense of what I was experiencing. I felt things that I didn't know what they meant. Everything went numb. In fact, so numb that it, that it literally, physically, some people go into a form of shock, which is that you're a, a body that no longer is fully alive and living. It's just functioning as a body. And, but then what was interesting is that people who described what it was that then unnumbed them, right? The, the, the moment, and, and not always, but many people could actually kind of go back to a place where they had an experience. The very first thing that people experienced was something that they said incited within them a feeling like they were a person again. It, what we found was that there were sort of metaphorically speaking things that were none of them linear. So the part of the experience of the early state, the early part of, of healing was that a person, whatever the context felt something that unnumbed that is that they felt vibration again. So sound is always based on vibration, but the sound wave is actually not exclusively entering your body by way of your ear. Sound waves are actually whole body. So if you've ever had the experience of why, if you ever ask yourself the question, why does music move me? Why does drumming affect me in the way that it might? It's because that vibration is a whole body experience. It enters by every, every cell that you have available to you. And so when, when a person would say, I, I felt like a person again, it actually is about something where you have the experience of something that was no, not vibrating, beginning to have a sense of vibration. But that was often captured by people with the word voice. And, and voice was very interesting because I just described it to you. The voice, so we, we sometimes take the word, especially sociologists and political scientists, we sometimes take the word voice to mean power. That is that power to the people, give people the voice and sort of voices like, um, you know, here we go, social movements, we're, up, we're bringing voice, right? But it, metaphorically, actually, voice has, so one of the things when we're talking about that which is not linear and that which is linear, point A to B is linear. The nonlinear has to have other metaphoric directions. So a lot of metaphors are around the orientation or the direction. My anger heated up. I had to cool down. I don't know, you could just, almost every language, you'll find that when there are metaphors, they often point to kind of directional things. So in this case, voice was a word used to talk about a journey that had to go deep down inside and had to happen over and over again in order for something to come up 
and out that was not fully understood. In other words, one of the challenges that people talked about was that having a sense of voice meant that I had the space to figure out and explore things that I felt that I had no words for. In other words, what had happened to me was, uh, was in, the, in the world of the inexpressible. So sometimes when it's inexpressible, I have to repeat it over and again. That's why sometimes the notion of repetition. So in English, we would say, if you're going in circles, you're not going anywhere. Actually, people would say going in circles is not about going in a circle. It's about going around in order to get down somewhere to a place where you feel it, but you don't know what it is. And when it comes up, it's got to go around a while. And that also has to do with what I sense is the environment that receives this inexpressible, the, the soundscape. So, um, and that was often referred to as the sense of, of being proximate where a conversation was not just words, but became meaningful. So how does a conversation become meaningful? In, in other words, that it's imbued with something that has a restorative quality to it. And what we, what, we, what we found was that people had this sense of almost of echo. So it was like the sound came, but it was in a place where it could be received and it was close enough that by way of the eyes or the sensation or the heart, I could feel that others were present with me. And this was had some explanation then as to why people in local communities often talk about um, concepts like national healing or the peace process as being very, very distant from them. That it, it does not feel like it means anything in their lives. And that's partly because there's a proxemics to the conversation that they feel is needed for it to be meaningful. They have to be within an, the actual soundscape of the conversation. That is that when I speak, I can see that my words have touched. Notice again how these are all very nonlinear, but um, very much related to vibration. That it touched you and somehow it came back to touch me. And when I sensed that you sensed me, then something vibrated also with me, which is why a small group conversation of people who have experienced something similar is often experienced as very powerful. Not because anybody had an answer, but because people sensed something that was creating a deeper um, significance for that moment. So what, what we found was that a, a lot of the metaphors actually sound, and of course sound is based on vibration, but sound is multi-directional. That process describes something that's very nonlinear. It's often about uh, um, depth, it's about circling, it's about expansive. Okay, so if we, let me see what the next slide is. I can't, if it's oh, not, sorry. If it's, how do I get to, okay. So um, now we're thinking of, I find this very interesting to think about conflict transformation, conflict itself, the very shift from resolution to transformation as process. So what is the process? How do we do it? Especially when we're frustrated or protracted uh, in the case study that you're going to do or about self-determination, about something that is so essential to our existence. And we're supposed to be patient uh, with process or repetition or overlapping layers and um, and the answer that lay that act would give is yes, because that's what human means. And if we go back to yesterday with the peace circles and you think about the power of that, the power of the vibration of the voice of connecting, what is proximal, close, and what seems too far away that doesn't even touch you in this metaphorical sense of sound. So then how do we resonate or what resonates in conflict and what dissonates? So this idea of human beings connecting in this energetic resonant way as part of this process of, of transformation and allowing people. So he also discusses in the next bit about how they use poetry and sound and music in order to get to the depth that is sometimes hard to get to when you've been under um, 
really violent conditions or experience something so so tragic and violent. Um, so I put the ball of what I call this the ball of power <laughs> um, there because sorry, the next um, step that I wanted to do with you is just add what I think that takes us back to a politics of location and the third world feminist and post-colonial and decolonial literature and um, uh, a very situated context of what is this power structure at the live level. And for me, the way that acts sort of brushes over that in a way that's too easy because yes, we have to do these deep relationship work and at the same time, be aware of these power structures and dynamics. So I am only putting this here uh, because I'd rather us have a little more time at the end to do some discussion for you to think about, but also for you in the next sessions, because you're gonna have one with Ijin Jang and Dr. Carlos Pedrosa that questionize, questions the whole, um, how do you decolonize peace and peace theory, race and colonialism. And so maybe you can do a critical reflection of that, of conflict transformation to broaden, to even make it more powerful of how you can do this in your work if this is resonant to you. Remember, you're asking what travels and what doesn't. Uh, and also, when you're thinking about the, the case study of the afternoon, uh, conflict transformation in Indonesia and the Philippines, what are what are what is the question of self-determination within that? And I guarantee there are those power dynamics. So the, the broader structural realities that also make up the conflict terrain. Uh, and then how do we do it? For me, this is really important to add indigenous knowledges, a ways of knowing that is a holistic approach to the entire human being. Uh, and then I, in the um, summary of this, this little topic, I talked about how Ojibwumi asks us to think about it as a world sense. So not just, we know worldview is a metaphor for thinking about the broad sense of things, but she wants us to think about world sense, the whole being and how we might understand through sound. You can think about in your own cultural context through silence, through vibration, uh, through all of these feelings, uh, other ways of knowing that maybe aren't valued in the same way in a conflict realm. And, and it's difficult because if you're in a project and they're like, we're only getting this money for this, if we write this and we do that and it's resolution related, well, now you're in the tension of the reality of development or the reality of um you know, conflict. So, and the other thing for me that is really important and goes back to the original comment, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the person who made it on our first day, was asking us to think about, you know, how do we see and understand and view a whole context and how one person can name the conflict is this and the other person is this and they're at fisticuffs, right? They're ready to, if not kill one another, then do serious harm. Uh, and so then for me that we're, we're struggling in a realm, a uh, technological realm that has this post-truth element to it or alternative facts and um, you know, what is not true. And so it's important for me to think what happened, what actually happened uh, and to be aware of my politics of location that's gonna read what happened through those lenses and what that might mean. So for me, I'm, I'm very um, involved in 1619 project. If you, I, when, when I asked the question about race in my own context and conflict, and I said, when did it begin? I wrote 1619 and then really, uh, because you know it goes way, way back. So, um, and then I'm part of this poor people's campaign with Reverend Barber, but part of the indigenous people's first nations chapter. So, you know, what involvement can I do within seeing that work. So what is my creative capacity? What is my role? And then that is a really important question to ask. What, what is our own individual role? So, oops. So that gets us to this web. Uh, Layer Act talks about this web. Um, Gloria talked about this web of relationships. So um, of mind, heart, body, intuition, spirit, energy. And then what does that mean for our action? How do we take action? How are we actional? in this world, again, in this radical interconnectedness. And for you as conflict workers or facilitators, whether that be in academia, on the field, in your own personal lives, uh, how does that take shape? And I just wanted to share this web with you. This was the, um, a 
class I just taught in Castellón, Spain um, with Jiju, who you're going to have, and Jenny Jang, who you will also have coming up. We taught the three of us together. And this was the web, the conflict web that they said we had to think about when we we're thinking about conflict. So I mean, it's complicated and it's multidimensional. If you think about a web, it's not flat. It's got lots of, uh, lots of layers to it. So it's not easy, the work that we're doing. Uh, but this shift to transformation and the shift to a positive bias, even if it's an active positive bias towards this can change. Um, I find myself very frustrated these days in this country. Uh, and so I, I keep reminding myself this can change. How do I, what is the transformative nature of this? And I don't have to do it alone. Look at this beautiful space that we're creating together and what that means to make this interconnected web together, even when we disagree. Um, so I'd like, we've got about uh, 45 minutes to do what I would like to do for final reflections. Um, final in quotes, because it's not. But I would like to go over really quickly uh, a mind map, the mind map, what I've kind of been doing of what we did today and how does it link together. So we started with the act of listening, uh, the deep listening to ourselves and to others and how that creates uh, respect and an openness and openness of heart. Then we move to a politics of location, which has a little more sharpness to it. What is the um, reality that we're living in, in terms of history, ancestry, um, the intersecting layers? What might I, as a white woman in the United States, what might I not see because I cannot experience it? And the indigenous knowing of the experience helps me have an understanding. How then do I broaden my view and open up uh, what I have access to? And, and I'm saying these things from a personal place, but you can do it for yourself. What how locating yourself helps you do that. Then what is the conflict? Just starting with who is in the room? Who are we? Trusting that the it is all there. So there's nothing that somebody from the outside can bring in to fix it. It's all there. And then how can that get harnessed in a vibration way that I vibrate with you and we feel one another with one another? Um, and then that brought us to conflict transformation and the shift in thinking, a way of thinking, and then moving that to healing. And so how does healing play a role? And I, I for me, I love that imagery of the sound. Um, I, I told you a little bit about my father. Uh, he, he was actually a very, very important human in my life. And he died, as I said, suddenly five years ago. And I, I really had to tell the story over and over and over again. I eventually went to a grief therapist for it because it was a very traumatic event. It was not, was not a nice, um, he went very peacefully, but it was not nice for the people left behind. So I, I had this trauma, this traumatic experience with this person I love deeply. And I, this, I resonated so much with later talking about how you get to the depth of what is inexpressible to lose such a dear human in my life. So in terms of conflict or violent conflict, when something has happened to somebody that is inexpressible, we can't even put it into words. It's so horrific. How do you get to a healing place or transformative place for that? So these are just sort of conceptual ways to think about these things. Uh, I'm bringing it back to the refugee camps here uh, because it's such an open view. And this is the this is a picture of the sun, but what I had never experienced, because I live in a very mountainous area, uh, there's a mountain here and a mountain there and here and here. So I can never see the moon rise. And so when I was in the refugee camps I, in the desert, I, wa I got to watch the moon rise and set. And it was, it was just a fascinating thing. And so what happens when we haven't experienced that? So that expansive view of life. Um, and so what I'd love for you to do is take out your active writing notebook again. And I'm gonna play a song that my sister actually just wrote. My sister is a singer songwriter, the one that, the new work uh, one um, it, that we are doing together. Uh, she, she just wrote this song and it's um, Feel It All. And so if we think of this holistic sense of the human, maybe you can feel it all while you're writing this. And maybe it even becomes part of the work that you want to submit at the end, if you're kind of taking notes for each um, 
topic. So maybe there's a quote from the document that I sent out that was interesting to you. Maybe uh, there's just something that really made you think about your own life in a way and you want to explore that. So I'm going to play uh, the song here and then we will write until the song is over. And you just write whatever, I mean, some of you might go like, what do I have to write? Because you're used to the teacher <laughs> telling you what to write. But I'm asking you in this action, reflection, action, we're now in reflection way to just allow what needs to come through your hand, through the pen onto paper. Whatever that is, is exactly what it should be. Okay, so I'm gonna just hit play here and we will write together as a community. Treading water, it's getting harder. What you gonna do? It's getting colder, get bolder. Come on, make a just finished writing what you were writing and then this was my idea for the ending we've got about um, 30 minutes so I was thinking we could do a breakout where you just share um, what whatever you wrote and maybe you can expand that to whatever happens in your breakout group uh, once again if there's a you're alone like some of you have been please just let me know and I will shift you over if I can't see it. I do look to make sure you're with people who are there. Uh, and then from the break, after we do the breakout group, I thought we could just all write one word or phrase in the chat that captures this topic for you or this time together. And then we can just open it to a broader open discussion uh, to close out. 
so that was sort of my idea. And moving from the song, I thought it I was like, oh, my sister literally just sent it to me um, yesterday. And I thought this is perfect for vibration and feeling it all. And what does that mean uh, in our conflict work and what we want to do? So um, and how we are vibrating one to the other, even though my vocal cords are going together here, it's going through a little crazy technological scheme that only Edom knows and understands. Um, so there we go on that note. And then just because I don't want to have to come back to this presentation, um, is this the end or just the beginning? And this was uh, me in the Sahrawi refugee camps on a dune, sand dune. So I got nice painted henna hands. Um, and then you'll have, we're not going away yet, but this is just so that you know there's um, lunch. And then you're going to have the great case study that helps you take some of these conceptual you know, even the stuff you don't agree with, how do you tease it out together as a group in a more hands-on uh, case study way? Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share. And then what I will do is I'll create the, um, uh, huh, where are we? Sorry, let me just get rid of that. Um, Oh, here we go. It just went away. Okay, so I'm going to recreate these rooms. Let's make um, let's make it five to six per room. Okay, here we go. No, not yet, not yet. Hi, Mom. Thanks. Yes, great. Okay, we're good. Everybody's matched up with people. Awesome. I don't know who's recording, but you might want to stop just because it's um, just going to be sharing for 10. Okay, so what we thought we could just do is write a chat, a, a word or a phrase in the chat that's sort of representative of your time as our time as a learning community in the sense of Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks. And um, with great thanks to Alberto, Ari, Dam all of the organizers that I'm missing your names. Um, but thank you so much for this incredible hosting me in this incredible way. I was very annoying everybody. <laughs> I was the bad student. So I thank them so much. Uh, so please just, if you feel like it, put whatever in the chat and then um, open discussion. We have about 15 minutes. So go for it for gold uh, if you wanna share. If you don't, if you're tired, that's okay too, but we'll just have open, open free time. I, I will mute myself so you guys go forward. Hello. Hello, Dr. Jennifer. Yes. Yes. Can I go ahead? Yeah, go, cool, please. Sorry. Just go for it. Uh, I'm Adebola from the Gambia here. My time now is a quarter to quarter after five in the morning. So I have to be awake to attend this program. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my time here is I, I used to join from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. So I have to keep awake to attend the program. Anyway, I want to appreciate you for- You're, you are amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> My colleagues are, are they all on bed now. They are in bed, but I have to keep awake anyway. 
Thank you for your wonderful lectures, and I actually learned a lot from you. Uh, I have learned so many things. I've learned about uh, listening skills and in, in, its importance in conflict resolutions. I've also benefited from your immense uh, lectures about policies of locations as well, including reflection. Uh, but precisely, I want to make a contribution, especially in that area. I have seen that you have gone more of practical than academics. You know, let me say that. Uh, in the areas of policies of location, I observed one thing. You talk about positionality and uh, intersectionality. I want to believe positionality could be seen from the realm of individualism, probably your positions, your understanding of the conflict. Why intersectionality is induced by your fictional social engagement within a given environment. But I want to know, I want to say that, you know, Conflict itself, or conflict transformation as metamorphosed, it has gone beyond uh, these two basic levels uh, because uh, there's now an application of principles of cosmopolitanism to conflict resolutions and conflict transformation. Why cosmopolitanism? Because where you live uh, or the world itself is now a global village. I'm trying to see whether it is possible to have a global approach or global approaches to conflict transformation. Why do I have to say this? Because the interconnectivities of, you know, of the global system itself propel conflicts, you know, to be transnational. And we said, when being, excuse me, can I go ahead? Yes, I said- Sorry, I was uh, just, the, just, I was just uh, applauding okay. your yes. comment. I said, the connectivities of the global system, which has made it transnational, to that word, conflicts and its consequences is not felt alone where the where it has happened. You know, there's now a kind of split over effect of conflict. For example, in the country where I live, there was a time of uh, you know political crisis, and the nearby countries felt it so much. Now, I came up, or uh, in the course of my lectures with my students, I came up with ideas of you know the fact that you need to understand conflict from the range of where it has happened. You must see it, how it affects others as well. So this is why I try to come up with cosmopolitanism. We must grasp and see conflict from the range of a global phenomenon because it is we, we must see it as a global problem that actually requires global solutions. You know, and the, the applications of these global solutions should be able to cut across different facets of cultural environment. So uh, your teachings about positionality, still I agree with you. I would probably agree with you with your intersectionality, but uh, I just want to have this to do that. We must see conflict from the range of a global perspective. We must see approaches that can be applied in a way that if it happens in India, can we also approach this? Can we also make use of this approach in Gambia? Can it be transnational? Can it cut across? Can it be a global solution to conflict? Because natures of contemporary conflict, as you said, conflicts are no longer traditional. I need to say this. Many conflicts now are now, you know, they're, they're, they're contemporary. Look at the pandemic issue. It's an example of contemporary conflict. Terrorism is an example of contemporary conflict. Conflicts are no longer induced mostly by ethnicities or by religions. There are now, you know, transnational issues whereby no one is left, you know, uh, outside the shore of the conflict, other the geography of the country of the conflict, because you know uh, there are now issues that connect us together. Globalization, we talk about the effect of it. You know, we talk about climate change and all these are uh, the basis by which contemporary conflict now emanates. So I am trying to say we must grasp and look at conflict from this perspective of a global phenomenon, and how do we now provide solutions that reflect it as global solutions? Thank you, Lindis. I, I just wanted to say I absolutely agree. I think that is a fantastic um, adding to uh, and also um, great for me to think about how to add a more system. So that in the conflict transformation field, there's this idea of the bio system, the system itself being so integrated now. Uh, so from the nation state to concept to, you know, thinking how we are nothing, what happens over here affects over here and then of course, it's so positioned and has its own context, but it's also so integrated together. So yeah, that's fantastic um, for me, addition that is missing in mind. So fantastic. Thank you. Alberto, do you want to add to that? Thank you. No, I think that's, that's a, yeah, 
a valid, really valid point. And I think the, that I should probably say that the whole idea of this is to encourage you, to encourage a diversity of, of perspectives, a diversity of points of view. So um, in terms of the engagement that we are going to uh, to encourage, not, not just from the presenters itself, but also from the participants, is that what we hope to do is in this course is to, to introduce a number of different ways of looking at things and not just, and, and I think it's, it's quite clear from the perspective of uh, Jennifer Murphy and Gloria. And so far it would appear to you that uh, Jennifer and Gloria have been working together and kind of presenting a particular kind of perspective uh, to conflict and perspective to peace building. But you will realize as we proceed in the next uh, few days, there would be different points of view. And next week, for example, you will in fact come, uh, you, you know, you will meet several presenters that uh, some would take it from a global perspective, uh, from precisely what you have been talking about from your own experience in, in West Africa, isn't it? In Gambia, right? Yes, you're right. And, yeah, and so, you know, looking at the, 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 the issues in Gambia, for example, some would take a different perspective. And mm -hmm. in my case, you know, I would probably uh, look at what you have raised as important issues uh, from the political economic perspective. And uh, you know, so this is where we, we all have different ways of looking at it, but it does not mean in any way that one way is better than the other, or one way is uh, in fact more valuable than the other. It does not mean in any way uh, in, in that perspective. But what is really important is that in any kind of conflict or any sort of difficulties that we are facing in this world today, what we have to do is to listen to a range of different sorts of perspectives. And, uh, and when I, I do my presentation uh, next week, you, you know, you will, you, will, uh, you know, you, you come to appreciate uh, a point of view where I would say to you that, uh, yes, it's fantastic to have all these different perspectives, but what actually happens is that a lot of this is just becomes discussion and it just becomes <laughs> academic discourse. It just becomes people in the universities getting together and talking and all feeling really good about talking those views. But as we go on talking and as we go on discussing, as we go on deliberating and all these perspectives, the leaders in the world, you know, the ones who are actually making all the kinds of uh, decisions that affect all of us, those leaders are not listening to us. And this is where, you know, and, and those elites and, you know, people who are running corporations, they don't care about what uh, Jenny, Jennifer Murphy has just said. They don't care about, you know, me, Alberto Gomez. But I think they would really care a lot if all of us come together. The more people, so this is like a movement. You know, the more people we can bring alongside. And, you know, I, the other, sorry, I'm talking a lot here, but coming from my perspective, uh, it, it, I think very soon you, you, will, you will realize where I'm coming from. Uh, and to use the politics of location, uh, my training is more as a Marxist. So the, the issue about being a Marxist is that, you know, I've always been a Marxist from the time I was born, I think. But the, the point about being a Marxist is this, uh, and why I say I'm a Marxist is because I'm a socialist. I always believe that human welfare, social welfare must always come first. And that's, you know, that's where I come from. And then I realized that all these years, you know, I just find it, baffling as to why people can't see the things the way I see the world. Why is it, you know, that, why can't you just care about someone else? You know, why can't you just do something about the environment? So I kept thinking in terms of why are people so different from me? Can't they see it? You know, what's happening in the world today? And the problem is that we have been attacking each other. Within the socialist group, one socialist would say, oh, you got Marx, you know, you." You misinterpreted what Marx had said, and the other one would say, "No, but you have, you know, um, you." I disagree with you, and so they went on attacking each other and disagreeing with one another. 
while those people are running the world, the corporations, and they say, let them continue, let them continue debating. So peace philosophers have been debating one another. My philosophy is better than yours. And then they have gone on debating and those people who want war to go on in this world, they are happy. You know, let's go on debating. So let's look at ways of how we can look as, you know, I, I don't want to use the word middle ground, but let's look at ways of how we can negotiate a path, a way, a whatever you, way you want to call it, a journey into the future. And, you know, I, and why, why am I so concerned about what's happening in the world today? I'm not so concerned about myself because I don't have that many more years to live in this world. But why I'm so concerned is every time I look at my three granddaughters and I ask myself the simple question, what sort of world are we going to leave behind for them? And I think, you know, that's why we have to all come together, think about ways of how, you know, we can uh, it, perhaps, uh, I, I wouldn't say gloss over the differences that we have in our views, but let's all try to be you know, I know there is a, a pop group called One Direction, but let's all try to be more directive in terms of the way we are heading towards a, a future that it's going to work much better, not just for us as humans, but much better for the other creatures that we share this planet with. And most importantly, you know, let's work together so that the most important mother of all, Mother Nature, is able to continue, you know, providing for us. Yeah, and if I can just <laughs> please do, yes. Sorry, if I can just add to that. Um, I I have a very uh, post-colonial, decolonial, very political <laughs> sciencey approach as well. This conflict transformation, even for me, sometimes I go, really, Jenny, really. But I I think what you can do is. It's not about this is the way, as Alberto said, but what is helpful here for this journey forward to trying to create a different world that we that we are caring for it in a way uh, in generations from now, it will still be here, that we're not extinct. We're going on an extinction route. So, um, and caring for one another in a very deep way. And so then each of these, it was so hard for me not to get into uh, Jenny Zhang and Jiju, like all of these topics, I had to say, that's not your topic, Jenny. So uh, I agree. I, I have a very harsh kind of critical, I'm Marxist with you, um, Alberto. Uh, so it, it isn't about a w this is a way to do it. And honestly, it is not about this is the piece, please do it this way. It, it is trying to think differently so that we can tackle these really difficult problems that we, that we face together. So... Yeah. If may I ask a question? If anyone yeah, of you, like um, Professor Jenny or Professor Alberto can answer me. Like uh, Edibola said that we have been facing many issues right now in, in the world. Afghanistan issues, Palestine issues, ethnical issues, even sectarian issues, religious issues. We have crusades in the past. Like human history is very conflictual and conflict Right, like you said, developed us, but it also demolished our values, our principles. Like uh, in IR, we said national interest is above all the interest, or like uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend. So our values are not that well. That was in very, very, very old times, like very far. So how can we how can we transform or we can resolve transform or resolve our current issues because our leaders like Advola and Alberto says not sit together nor do peace exercises nor does inhale and exhale exercises they make the CN in closed room and that the CN based on national interest or their personal interest whatever you want to say but it affects the rest of the world. The decision making in the drawing rooms or the offices has impact on the rest of the world. America, what, what does America do? Or Afghanistan or Pakistan, India, Kashmir, like so many leaders. And the conflict transformation is very low. So 
so how can we balance it how as a person like me who is not in big office who is not in like have power like that decision maker so how can we participate in this peace making corporate so alberto I... you go <laughs> okay so you saved the world, Alberto. <laughs> no, no I, I don't think I will be the one to save the world. Uh, thank you. I'm in uh, Tuba, isn't it? Yes. Tuba, yes. It, is, it is you that I'm looking, you know, you are the one who I'm looking forward to in terms of every one of us have to inspire each other. And yes, I think it, you're, you're absolutely right that there are people who make these decisions that affect all of us. Yes, you are absolutely right about that. Now, as an anthropologist, I'm also uh, a way that, look, uh, you know, I look at human history. So let us ask certain kinds of questions about the institutions that existed in the past. I was just watching a documentary uh, on Australian television yesterday about parliaments in, in Australia. Yes. And it was only in 1983 that uh, they had only one uh, member of parliament in, in the Australian parliament that was, you know, female. Yes. The only in, it was only in 1983. And that person uh, who was a senator passed a, you know, a, a, a piece of legislation in parliament and it was to do with making discrimination, uh, sexual discrimination Ill uh, illegal. That was in 1983. So when we look at it, uh, one of the greatest problems that we have in this world today is patriarchy. And so we, we have to do something. And when we look at the, the problem of patriarchy and in, institution that in fact underlies a lot of the problems that we face in the world today, whether it's to do with militarism, to do with the fact that you know, patriarchy is bad, not just for women, it's also bad for men. And especially if you're a foot soldier, you know. Patriarchy is really awful for you because it's going to cut your life drastically. So let's look at how, what have we done uh, in terms of dealing with this problem of patriarchy, gradual steps. Mm -hmm. Now, if we actually look at uh, historically, you know, the human history uh, from an anthropological perspective, humans in the past, they lived in terms of gender, they lived fairly equal males and females lived equal lives. The, when we look at agriculture, the males have to be appreciative. They have to value the fact that it was women who in fact started agriculture because they were the ones who, women had much you know, deeper knowledge about plants and botanical you know, knowledge that allowed agriculture to be one of, you know, one of the first technological revolutions in human society. So let's look at all these kinds of ways of how humans have culturally evolved, you know, from the time. I mean, evolution is a terrible word, but however, you know, we look at how the transformations that have taken place in human society. So when we come today, yes, when you talk to some of the younger, um, you know, uh, females today, they take for granted that that, oh, look, you know, there's so many women in parliament today, but it was a fight. It was a struggle and we have to continue struggling and a struggle where males have to play a part as well. That patriarchy is an uh, institution that needs to be challenged. Then we have to start looking at various kinds of uh, other sorts of institutions. Look at slavery, for example, you know, the, while some would say that slavery has ended, but however, slavery has taken a different form in terms of, you know, in different parts of the world. And we find that uh, child exploitation, we, we see all these kinds of, of problems that existed in, in human society, but eventually uh, people are the ones who have got together, they work together and they cooperated and the most important thing is they struggled. It's a struggle and made the kinds of changes that we, we have today. Let me just very quickly, once uh, when I was giving a lecture 
on uh, gender equality to my introductory anthropology course. And a young female student, uh, you know, I teach introductory anthropology. So the students are all mostly, you know, like 18, 19 years old. So a young female student comes up to me and, uh, you know, as, as the, the professor, you stand on a lectern on the stage and you're almost like untouchable, you know, with four or 500 students in your class. So this young female student comes up to me and she says to me, you know, uh, I, I have problems with feminism. And she said, you know, I disagree with your view on the, the importance I mean, of feminism. Yeah, the importance of feminist movement. And she said, I'm an anti-feminist. So my, and, and one of the things I said to her, you know, you should be thankful to the feminists because otherwise you as a young female, you as a young female 18 year old student would not have dared come up and stand up and talk to an older male professor like me. And I said that, so, those movements, those feminists that struggle, they have given you a voice, as you mentioned, truly, that's correct. And they have done the hard yards, as they say, the hard work in bringing this to this level. So I think it's really important that all of us, you know, are irrespective of our own background, irrespective of our own cultures, where you are located, as uh, you know, Jennifer Murphy puts it so nicely, and we, in fact, have to, you know, all work together and help me, you know, because I'm not going to live that long, not, not that many years left for me on this planet, but please help me so that, you know, I, I know that my granddaughters would be in safe hands from the leadership that all of you are going to show in the I just want to add one thing. There are moments when I completely think humanity is going to die out. <laughs> I do. I have terrible thoughts. But then, but then I think, no, everybody has to play their part and to figure out what is it the part that you want to play and to trust that others are going to play a part. So when I'm here in this group, when I see the work Alberto, Ari, Idam are doing to bring us together to hear the different struggles that we are each facing in order to figure out how do we play a part and stay connected in that fight because we want, all want liberation and freedom in a different way than uh, liberal democratic sort of thinking is, you know, true liberation. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much. Yeah, but Afifa, try not to feel hopeless because if you feel hopeless, then in other words, uh, whoever that's running this world has won because we must do everything as uh, Raymond Williams says that to be truly a radical we must make hope rather than despair convincing so we have to in fact hold on to hope and those people who are in despair um, and you know here I'm going to to tell you a bit about deep you know very quickly now, the reason that I finally decided, uh, you know, together with uh, Jenny Murphy, why we settled on the name of Deep, and of course, you know, you can see Deep Listening, Deep Ecology, all these, you know, use. And uh, I grew up in a generation where my favorite band was Deep Purple. But anyway, but, you know, the, the important thing here is that uh, in Sanskrit, for example, you know, from my own tradition, from my own background as, as uh, as a South Asian, when we look at Sanskrit, the word deep means small, is small lamp or light. So it is, you know, when we have Deepali or Deepawali, it's the festival of light. So in deep, we believe very strongly that each uh, individual, each person who belongs to deep is like a small lamp, a small light that is illuminating the darkness in the world. So we have a world, yes, we have darkness around us, but if each one of us holds a small lamp and illuminate this darkness, this is where I think we can make a difference. You don't have to join deep. You don't have to be part of us, but anything that you do, as long as you know, it is uh, driven by a desire to make a difference in this world, 
Um, and this is where, you know, I, I believe very strongly. I learned it not from any, yes, I, I read uh, John Paul Lederach. I read all these various uh, people that Jennifer Murphy has referred to. But my so-called wisdom, if I can put inverted commas around this, does not come from any of those books that I've read, not any of those books at the back there. It is a time that I spent living in the forest with the Malaysian Aboriginal people, the indigenous peoples. And that's why the point I wanna make here is that as Jenny has pointed out, you know, in terms of elicitive conflict transformation, the knowledge is there. You know, all of you, in fact, uh, you have this knowledge. And if you don't, you know, um, you know, I had to give a course in Innsbruck uh, and the course was on entitled Alternative Epistemologies. So finally, one student put her hand up and she said, are you saying that instead of listening to you, I should have just stayed at home and listen to my grandmother. And I said, yes. And I said, you know, the, the people in the past, our ancestors, you know, in terms of ancestral history that Jenny is talking about, they held a lot of the knowledge, the information, the traditional culture that are important. And so if we are looking at our human history now, perhaps we have to go back and look at our past in order to understand what can we retrieve from all these cultures that the colonial masters and the various corporations have said that there is no room for in this contemporary world of ours. Let's go back into this dustbin of history and take out all these gems that we have unfortunately just cast into this dustbin without looking at the potential of what this. So in other words, our future lies very much in our past. And with the past combined with the present, I think our future will be a much better future for all of us, not just humans, all of us, irrespective of our religious background, irrespective of our cultural, both males and females, all the various things that have divided us, whether you're African or you're Asian or European, I think the future has to be a common humanity. That's the only way we can strive. I know all this kind of talk is so romanticized, it's so exotic, but it is possible, yeah? Um, and we have to keep focusing on the fact that it is possible. Because once people tell you that it is impossible, then you have already lost them. You know, you have lost the game. You might as well just, but don't give up. Keep thinking that someone's impossibility will be your possibility. Agree. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I, I sound like I'm preaching, you know, I sound so much like a preacher, but yeah, I wanted to be a priest, but you know, I realized that I wouldn't have been a very good priest. <laughs> <laughs> Alberto, Adebola asked me to make the connection between conflict transformation and peace building, but that's another class. <laughs> Somebody's doing peace building, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will yeah. be covered, so, yes. Yeah, so just wait for that. But all I will just say very quickly, going off of what Alberto said is um, from the conflict transformation in terms of what Alberto just said, that we have the capacities to transform and, and build the hope for that. It would be life-giving and life-nurturing would be peace building. And looking, as you said, with the systems from the global to the small, um, the ba a balancing. And so what... Alberto was talking about with patriarchy, that's an imbalance. You can think of it energetically or you can think of it structurally. You can, I mean, there's lots of ways to conceptualize imbalance of a system. And when the system is out of balance, then how do you build towards something that's life nurturing and life giving? Which would, for me, would be the connection between transformation and the building of the creating of something. But I, I don't believe in a recipe. That's why the very contextualized, not in the deep, not in the, 
separate from everything else that's going on, absolutely interconnected, and yet has to be within the people, the place, and they know how to, wherever you are, you know how to make some type of change, transformation in your own context. Absolutely connected to a global one because we're facing so, as, as you said, the COVID-19 is a perfect example of this interconnectedness. So, so are they, yeah. Um, uh, Adeboja, is that how you pronounce it? Adebola. Did I, sorry, did I pronounce the name correctly? Yes, very well, sir. <laughs> okay, now <laughs> let's take, uh, you know, some of your fellow participants. So we have Delavar and uh, Najiba, who are members, they've created a circle in uh, which in Urdu, I can't pronounce the word, but in Urdu, it means empathy circle. So it's a small group of several, you know, five or six people in, uh, in, you know, around the area of Islamabad and they get together. So it's a small group and they get together and they start talking to various people about the importance of empathy, about gender, about, um, you know, a, and, and trying as much as possible to inculcate such values to various people. So, you know, this is one of the ways that we can do, in other words, uh, let me say I'm, I've given up about those big, uh, big projects in the sense of let's let's try to change, uh, you know, let's let's try to change the, the U.S. government, for example. Okay, they're going to go on and do whatever they want to do, right? And even in Australia. So what we do is that we start a movement, you know, and, and small groups of people. It starts. And these are like uh, these, you know. Once I got in trouble, I said that the deep is like uh, like the Al Qaeda. We are all small cells, but instead of violence, we focus on peace. You know, so it's all like small cells of group of people that come together. Yes, Delavar, uh, Dara, the Hamdadi circle of empathy. So you know, you bring small groups of people, and then you start, uh, and then they. If you, you start to inculcate these values and then they begin to bring another small group of people. So that's how we build, you know? And I'm, I'm confident that uh, there are so many different groups of people right around the world. And I'm sure, you know, within Gambia, you know, you have so many like-minded people and bring, bring them together. You know, this is where, when we talk about leadership, it's not you forcing yourself as the leader but you actually, you know, coordinating, bringing people together, facilitating, and that's, you know, kind of the leadership role that you can play. Bring people together and then say, let's try to make these little changes. Now, what's going to happen is that the ones who are in power, they're going to use violence because that's the only language that they know. And you know that through the, in the history, uh, in our political history, we have, people like Gandhi and Mandela. We have all these people who, in fact, uh, even in Marxist history, we got like Rosa Luxemburg, all these various uh, you know, leaders who, in fact, realize that if for the people in power, if violence is their language, then we have got to change that language. And people and those people in power who use violence, um, they do not know how to deal with nonviolence, and so this is where you know we'll find that when Vedabas talks about nonviolent communication. Um, so in, in my case, you know they they can uh, you know they can beat me up, they can do whatever they want, and probably you know even to the extent of killing me, but it does not ever remove the reasons, the ideologies, the ideas that I tried to get across, because that is a lot more powerful than breaking some of my bones. Does that make sense to you? And I think this is where we have to, in fact, uh, look at those who have, you know, the, the ones like the, uh, you know, kings of the world, the Mandela's and the, 
uh, you know, um, Gandhis and all these various, you know, people who have lived in this world, uh, who have used, I say the word used, in fact, employed and used uh, nonviolence as a strategy. Martin Luther, of course, Martin Luther King. That's one I meant, King, sorry, Roji, but you're absolutely right. Kings, the Gandhis, and the and, yeah, and and I think it's really important that we we go back and look. And the important message here is that we tend to remember the males. We tend to remember Gandhi. We remember, uh, you know, Luther King and and Martin Luther King. We remember Nelson Mandela, but the everyday, the women, you know, the women who, in fact. Yeah, for you is Reverend Barber, but it's the women, you know, who are the everyday peace builders and the nonviolent activists. Uh, so, you know, I think all of us have to come come together. So, uh, yeah, this is a good way to to end what I think is a marvelous presentation by. By Jennifer Murphy, you know Jenny, you as usual, uh, you you just uh, I know uh, Jenny always uses the words awesome. That's a favorite word, and another favorite word of hers is kick ass. So you have basically kick ass. Well, I, I just want to, um, thank you to this group because this forum is my least favorite forum where I have to give a talk or you're in this session. I love a, a long period of time where we form relationships and then we can go into deep and uh, really, you know, tease out and then do what Alberto says, imagine and construct. What is that going to mean for our hands, getting them dirty? So I just want to thank you for Alberto and everybody for the confidence and then supporting me because I really, this is my the hardest form for me is this one, and this group made it very easy. So thank you all for, especially the beginning technological difficulties, just ro rolling with it. Um, and it was very kick-ass. So <laughs> my dad hated when I used awesome, by the way. He said, you're overusing this. Awestruck is something divine, Jenny. So um, I, I try not to so much anymore, Alberto, in memory of my father. But um yeah, thank you to all of you. And uh, even when you feel the hopelessness, then you reach out to the little lights here, like Alberto, Ari, Idam, creating this or the lights. So when we feel ours dimming, we can join someone else's too. It's not. It's normal to feel overwhelmed. I think with with the gravity of everything we're facing. Jenny, Our, on behalf of yes. the Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta, I would like also to say, like you know, many thanks for your like you know uh sharing today with all the participants from like you know different group yeah so uh it, it it there are many things that we of course the participant has learned yeah therefore like you know it's very beneficial what you share us today and hopefully like you know inshallah we'll have another program Yes, Prof. <laughs> yeah, in person because I only said yes to this because it's Alberto. Oh yeah. Because yeah, yeah, otherwise, yeah, yeah. otherwise it would have been a no yeah, way. I that's know. it's not my <laughs> I, I I'm like Alberto. I don't like this big talk and let's get down and let's get our yeah. hands dirty and yeah. do this. I know I because just, this I, is COVID, Jenny. Otherwise, we like yeah. no will uh, yeah. invite all of the speakers and participants in Indonesia, no, to see around, do something, think yeah. something. But with the situation, and and yeah. and resonate with one another, we drink yeah. tea. Binding, so. yeah, but yeah, what can we do? But you know, at least we. Uh, no, I I don't mean it that way, Ari. I just mean that I thank you so much for making this so easy in a format that is usually <laughs> difficult for me. Yeah, you are a star. As always. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So we'll have a break, Prof, until two. Okay.
Uh, you are unmute. You unmute, Prof. Hi, Ari. Yes. Okay. Uh, we will just get into our room for a short while and say okay, thank yeah. you properly. Sure. Ari? Yes. Do you want to form a, a room? Okay. Uh, let me I think just... you have to make, no, not I'm, make... I am not the host or co-host, Prof. I think I need to ask Idam to do this. Is it clear, wait, wait, Idam? I think I can make you the okay. host, Ari. Okay. Hold on. Let me see how I do this. Participants. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Dave, Dave is doing it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was fantastic, uh, Jenny. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how that. <laughs> no, it was, yeah, it was you know, really. Even, <laughs> I don't know this. You know, now is nobody's no, no. The students are not around, right?